air transport, although of course, okay, recording. Uh, also, uh, there is a human component in this. Uh, but in any case, let's say that viewer discretion or viewer creativity, I would say it's, uh, it's, uh, it's advised. Uh, I'm also sorry not to be able to be there with you. This is what we have in these days. I'm also, uh, I'm also seeing that you have cake uh, beyond coffee. So I'm really sad not to be there. Now I want cake, but whatever, let's go. Let's move to the talk. So I'm going to talk about air transport and uh, specifically uh, delays. Uh, delays. Delays in air transport. I'm not going to tell you what delays are because I'm afraid that you all know what delays are. I hope that you didn't have a lot of delays to, to go there. So in general, we, we say that uh, delays are caused by different types of disruptions that we can have in the system. For instance, bad weather, technical difficulties that you can have. And one point to that, is usually surprising to people is that delays are not something bad in the system. Actually, there is something, it's something that has a positive side of it. And uh, if you are wondering how can it be, let's imagine a very simple situation. Let's suppose that you are flying, you are arriving at an airport, and in, at the beginning, in the front of this airport, there is bad weather, a thunderstorm, something like that. Uh, you can have two alternatives, let's say. The first one will be to avoid the thunderstorm. So have a routine, fly a different ways or whatever. You will lose maybe 10, 15 minutes. You will arrive 15 minutes later at the airport. So you will have a delay. Is this bad? Well, kind of. Uh, what is the alternative? You could just fly in the middle of the thunderstorm. From a technical perspective, aircraft are very able to do that. That is absolutely no problem. Uh, so you can avoid the delay. On the other hand, you will have 10 very rough minutes in an aircraft, like bouncing around and all of that. So this is a typical example of, well, delays can be avoided, but we don't actually want to avoid the delays. They're not as bad as they can be. I mean, they are there and we can accept them. What is really bad actually in air transport are delay propagations. They're also known as secondary delays, knock-on, reactionary delays, they have different names. And this is when uh, one delay is generated in the system. This delay is not absorbed, but affects subsequent flights. Uh, this is quite important because if you look at official statistics, for instance, between years 2018 and 19, these are official statistics for Europe. And these are the last two years that we had before like the whole air transport went uh, crazy. Uh, as you can see, we have that reactionary delays are around the nine minutes on average per flight, which is half of the total delays. So the point is that we have half of the delays that are okay, that are acceptable, but then we have another half of the delays that are absolutely not okay and that we want to get rid of them. And so why do we have this kind of uh, propagation? Well, uh, the simple case is when there is an aircraft that arrives late at an airport and then the, the subsequent flight of the same aircraft will be delayed. And if you have uh, flown, uh, let's say in recent years, so you will probably have heard like, uh, 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 we are set to announce that your flight is late because of the late arrival of the previous aircraft, uh, which is, if I may say so, quite a, a lame excuse because it's like, sorry, I arrived late because I left my home late. Yeah, but your, it's your point to leave your home on time and then you would have, have arrived on time. So it's not really a good excuse. It's just what, what it is, it's just what happened. Uh, but this can also be created by, for instance, the connectivity of passengers. That is when uh, you have a flight that is delayed, you have some passenger in it, these passengers have to take the full, uh, different flights to go somewhere else. And uh, as they are later, they have to uh, delay the second flight in order to leave enough time for these passengers to connect. Uh, of course, this is not always the case. This, always, this usually happens if you have several passengers that have to connect to the same flight because otherwise the cost would be too high for the airline to, let's say, to reschedule all these passengers or if just you have one passenger that is somehow VIP, like for instance, a business passenger, you usually wait for a business passenger because of course it's a lot of money involved. Uh, but you can have even more complex situation, like you can have connecting crews when the crew of one aircraft has essentially to change aircraft, to move to another aircraft, 
And of course, if they are late, the subsequent flight will be late. But you can have even technical problems at the, at the airport because the gate is not free when the aircraft arrive and then they have to, to arrange a different gate and so forth. So there are several uh, causes, let's say, of, uh, of uh, reactionary delays. And uh, I'm making this long introduction just to introduce you to the problem, and then you will see why I think this is related with all of this that we that you have been discussing in the in today and yesterday. In any case, the point is that we have a process that is quite interesting because it's uh, organized into different levels from a technical uh, from a temporal point of view. So on one hand, you have that these reactionary delays are essentially controlled or they are caused by the availability of resources and also by the fact that airlines, of course, try to mini minimize operational costs because one may say, well, delays are very easy to be avoided. I just put one single aircraft for, for every flight. And so even if a previous aircraft is late, that's not a problem because I have a different aircraft. Yeah, but you cannot do that because there is not enough money and also because resources are limited, airports have limited um, capacity, let's say, to manage uh, flights and so on. And all of this evolves on the long terms. That is, we are talking about years. You cannot buy an aircraft in a couple of days. Of course, this is a very long process. And also the capacity of airlines to change their planning and all of that, it's not a short-term process. They need some time to, to organize. But the actual propagation of delays, so this process that we, ha that we are seeing, is uh, happening on the very short terms. It's a matter of hours, and in, in some cases, we see even signals of that in the order of minutes. So we have a process that is kind of emergent in the sense that we have a lot of small um, agents, can be passengers, airlines, and so forth, that are taking decisions, uh, some of them on the short term, some of them on the long term, and then we see a phenomenon that is emerging from all of this that is on the large scale because it affects the whole air transport network and also on the short term. So there is this mismatch between the temporal scales of the actions of the different agents and especially in our capacity of observing the system. Uh, okay, so how can we tackle delay propagation? Uh, well, air transport is inherently an engineering field. So what engineers do is that they usually create models. And uh, I've seen plenty of models in my experience in air transport. And uh, I have to say that all of that, I think that they have the same problem is that they go to the micro scale. So essentially they try to model or to forecast the behavior of all the elements of the system. To give you some ideas, uh, there are models, uh, there are commercial, that are available and so forth, that try to uh, model the every, like the trajectory or the behavior of every single passenger inside a terminal to understand if that passenger will be late or not. As if passengers were rational people and that they don't stop at a shop to buy something, forgetting that they have a flight and will arrive to the flight late and so forth. So, I honestly don't see how you can model in a rational way all the behavior of all these different agents. Or uh, even in some cases, I've seen uh, a situation in which they try to model things that are, I think, beyond what can be uh, reasonably modeled. Like, for instance, there was a model that was trying to uh, forecast how many seconds would it take for the pilot to uh, comply with an instruction given the, the, by an air traffic controller. Uh, so like the, the pilot is there flying, suddenly he receives by radio, um, please turn right. And how ma many seconds will it take him to actually go right? As if you could model that, for instance, in that moment, the pilot was having a coffee as a cup of coffee is in his hand, so he cannot reach for the knob to turn it. So it has to put the coffee down. and. So, and does it really matter if it will take three seconds or five seconds to comply with that order? Well, I don't think so, but all models that you can find out there in our transport are this example of micro scale modeling, which you try to understand every single detail of the system. And this, from my point of view, uh, creates two main problems. So these are two main drawbacks. First of all, uh, there is a problem of missing information. 
we don't have all information about the system. We cannot have all the information. Like the previous example, the pilot, what the pilot is doing or is not doing, we cannot know that for sure because we cannot put a camera in every, in every aircraft. Uh, but besides that, even information that you may think that it's kind of public, it's actually not that easy to obtain. So for instance, um, passenger connectivity. Uh, this should be quite easy because that information is out there somehow. For sure, like airlines have this information because they are selling their tickets, so they know exactly which passenger will go to another flight. But uh, uh, on a more general level, so if you want to see the whole system, there are very few companies that have information about all the passengers that, for instance, are traveling in Europe. These are usually booking agency like uh, Amadeus, for instance, in Europe. And they have this information, of course, because they are selling tickets, so they perfectly know which passenger connected to which flight. Uh, the problem is that this information has a lot of commercial value because, as you may imagine, if I am if I'm working for Iberia, I would love to know what passengers of Air France are doing in their flights, how they connect. So this has a lot of uh, very high commercial value, and therefore, if you want to make a research on that and make a model or whatever, and you ask for that data, you can get them uh, provided you are, you want to, you are willing to pay a lot of money. And we actually tried to do that uh, a few years ago for a European project in which we wanted to model uh, the propagation of delays from the point of view of passengers. And the amount of money that they asked us was uh, let's say unbelievable. It was something incredible. And we had to say, no, wait, we are just researchers. You know, we don't have millions of euros to pay for that. Because of course, companies will pay that, that uh, for that information. And uh, this is the, the main problem. And even if we go, I mean, even worse, if you go to operational information, like for instance, uh, how crews are assigned to different flights. I mean, of course, airlines have this information, but they are not really willing to disclose this information to the public or to researchers in general. But okay, let's suppose that we have all the information that we need somehow, we pay a lot or we steal it somehow, and we can make this micro model. Okay, that's great. Then we have a model that we can feed it inside a lot of information and it will tell us what happened or what would happen in a day in Europe with all the flights. What we will get at the end is just a huge list of flights and delays or something like that. But okay, this is good. This is like the trees. We can see a lot of trees. We have 20,000 trees and we have the information about that. But does it give us an idea about the forest? That is the global picture. Uh, that is one problem is to have exact information about the micro scale process that is going on. Uh, a completely different problem is to get a global picture that we can understand about the propagation of delays, about how the global uh, system evolved. So the problem in synthesis, and this was all the introduction, is that we have a macro scale problem that is emerging from a micro scale dynamics. And we have very limited information about the micro scale dynamics, so we cannot just simulate it to get the, the result. And also we want to understand the macro scale consequences of this, of this phenomenon. So we have a problem. We have a serious problem. And actually it's so serious that uh, uh, pr delay propagation has been recognized as one of the major problems in air transport. It has major implications in terms of costs that it's generating. And actually, according to my to a statistic that I made a few years ago, uh, the amount of money that in Europe we are losing every year because of reactionary delays was the, sa the same amount of money that the healthcare system in Spain cost each year. So essentially, if we could get rid of delays of reactionary delays in Europe, we could pay for a healthcare system in one country. So it's a lot of money. It's really an important thing. But we have no way, really no way of tackling it. And we still have a propagation of delays. So what we said is, OK, can we look at other fields? Are we the only one that have this specific problem? Maybe someone else has already a solution or they have some ideas that we can steal. And actually that's the point. And we go back to the previous talk. So let's go and see what they have done in neuroscience. In neuroscience, they have exactly the same problem if you think about that, because let's suppose that I want to understand the human brain. Usually I don't want to understand, I mean, some 
people want to understand the microscale structure of the brain, but more, more in general, what I want to understand is how the brain works, how is it possible for the brain to compute information and to do what we do. So right now, for instance, I would like to understand what are the flows of information inside my brain, uh, why I move my mouth in the way that I move it to give this talk, how are memories uh, recovered to give this talk and so forth. So how can I remember the different slides? But we know that this is a macro scale emergent behavior of the brain that is emerging from the interaction of very small units that are the neurons that are in the brain. And we have plenty of them. And it's not feasible to just make a simulator of the brain, put it in a very rough terms. That is, we don't exactly, I mean, we know how individual neurons work, but there are still some uncertainty in this because there are plenty of different types of neurons, uh, how they interact between them. As we said in the previous, uh, as they say, you said in the previous uh, talk, uh, okay, electrical field seems to be the most important one, but there are other, there are chemical gradients, there are even mechanical gradients and so forth. So we, we are not even completely sure about one single neuron. And there is no way that we can make a simulation, including the several billion of neurons that we have in the brain. And even if we have that huge simulator, we will create a new brain, but we have no information about how the brain actually works. So the solution that they arrived in neuroscience in, the, in recent years, I would say in the last uh, 10, 15 years, it's what is called network neuroscience. Um, and we go back to another concept that we have seen yesterday, a lot of networks actually. So the idea of network neuroscience is I cannot record the activity of individual neurons. That's not a problem. Let's go one step back, let's zoom out. Let's record what actually we can, that is the activity, at least the electrical activities of different regions of the brain. So I will put an EEG, an electroencephalography machine on top of me. I will start the recording time series as here represented in the, in the slide. And then when I have this time series, I will try by using some mathematical tools to understand if there has been a, uh, propagation of information between these different regions. Once I have that, I can reconstruct a network that tells me essentially how different regions are connected together, how the information flows there, or if you want, how the causality inside the brain is moving. And once I have that, I have a much better representation of the macro scale behavior of the brain, and I can compare a um, healthy person, the brain of a healthy person, with someone suffering from, for instance, schizophrenia and try to see the difference and how the information is not, the information flow is not the same between both of us, of them. There are plenty of results. Uh, this is a field that is indeed increasing, it's still increasing and they are, they are getting very nice results on that. So my point of view is that, well, if they have done something similar in neuroscience, why don't we try to do something similar in air transport? So. I'm not going to say that the, that the air transport is like a brain, that would be too much. I don't think that the air transport is a essential being, but still we have a very similar problem because we have a problem that is created by different scales. At the lower scale, we have aircraft like neurons that are transmitting somehow information between them. This information is processed at the airport and then we have a global phenomenon or a global dynamics in which and that is what we are interested in. Uh, in. And uh, the important point is that uh, what I want to defend or to propose is that actually this delay propagation is an information processing phenomenon. That is, each airport at the end is receiving information from other airports in the form of the delays that incoming air, aircraft are uh, carrying with them. Each airport is processing this information somehow according to rules that we don't completely understand. And then is sending out to the system, to other airports, this information by means of the flights that are flying to other, uh, to other parts of the system. So the idea here is let's try to propose a new perspective in which this delay propagation is an information processing phenomenon. Uh, inspired in neuroscience, of course, because we want to use the tools that have been successful in neuroscience, so why not use them? 
and of course with application to uh, air transport delays. So going to some results to be more concrete, uh, how can we do that? Well, in a similar fashion to what I've shown you before, let's suppose that I want to see the propagation of information, that is the propagation of delays, between Madrid and Paris Charles de Gaulle. Uh, sorry, I have the technical uh, acronyms for Madrid, uh, Madrid Barajas and Paris Charles de Gaulle, uh, because of course uh, we come from air transport and we use acronyms everywhere. <laughs> but uh, this thing aside, how can we do that? Well. First of all, we have to record the equivalent of the EEG of a brain. And in this case, it will be time series of average delays at the different airports. So we can take one month of data for Madrid. And for instance, for each hour, we see what are the average delays of aircraft arriving to Madrid. And we create a nice time series with that. We do the same with Paris and we have two time series. And then we try to detect the flow of information between them. How can we do that? There are several metrics in the literature, but one that I'm sure you already know is the Ranger causality. That is a metric that at least tries to assess if there is a causality between two time series. So if there is a causality here, what we are saying is that, for instance, Madrid is causing or is driving the delays in Paris Charles de Gaulle. I don't know why, I don't know which aircraft exactly was the culprit for transmitting that the information. Maybe there was more than one aircraft. Maybe it was not even a single aircraft, but it was like a whole bunch of flights going through different cities. But at the end, I can see that there is, there is a causation between the two, uh, like the two, the two airports. And once we have that for our pairs of airports, we can go ahead and create a full network representation. That is, we take bunch of, uh, of airports in Europe and we try to reconstruct the full uh, network. If we do that, well, first of all, is okay, it is, seems easy. Of course it's not because as you can imagine, data are not easy to get. Uh, it seems incredible, but even the definition of what a delay is, is a quite complicated things in air transport. For sure, data are not clean. Uh, we can get a lot of weird results if we are not uh, careful with this, uh, with, with the process of pre-processing. And also the interpreting the resulting network is not that easy, but these are more technical things that I will, I will skip. I can come back if you, are, if you are interested. In any case, then we can plot the network resulting from the top 15 airports in Europe for a specific month. This was March 2015, and we get this network. And the yesterday when I was seeing presentation from, from you, I said, ah, wow, uh, actually we, have, we are using the same concept, the same ideas, right? Because uh, this is not a chemical network, this is not a reaction network, but in a sense it is, because what it's representing is how information is moved from one entity to the other, just that the entities in this case are uh, airports. And there is also a, Small but important difference uh, between, I guess, what we have seen yesterday and, uh, and the problem that we are tackling here. And is that we don't have the network. That is, you are very lucky when you are analyzing a chemical reaction, you exactly know the, like, the links that you have between the different spaces and so forth. Uh, we don't have that information. And this information, we have to reconstruct it by using metrics like Ranger causality and all of that. Uh, so this, this is a problem because uh, we have just our reconstruction of how the interaction were evolving. And especially this is kind of fuzzy in the sense that we cannot be certain. This is just a reconstruction. So we cannot be certain that this is actually the exact network of interaction that we had in the system. But let's say that this is our best guess. And just by looking at this, we can see the, let's say, the power of this approach because it's not just a collection of data, but we can even graphically see what's going on here. Like for instance, we can see that there is this airport that is uh, Lisbon uh, Portela, that if you can see, I don't know if you can see it well, but it has a lot of arrows arriving to it and just two arrows going out. So essentially it means that Portela is receiving a lot of delays and that this airport is like, a passive uh, uh, agent is just receiving delays from everywhere in Europe and they have just to, they have to handle them somehow. 
uh, the same with um, Dublin. Also, Dublin is, uh, let's say, a net receiver of, of delays. And then there are other airports that are not super clear here, but for instance, I think that Zurich and uh, London, especially, and Amsterdam, no, Amsterdam was an important one with a lot of arrows going out. So Amsterdam is not just generating delays, but it's also propagating these delays around. And this is very nice because now we have a, a very simple representation of the process of this very complicated process, but we have a simple representation that we could even use to somehow tackle this in the sense that we could go and see what is happening in Amsterdam. Why is Amsterdam sending out so many delays around Europe? Uh, as my background is more in network theory, uh, we can go a little bit more technical these, and for instance, uh, calculate some properties of these networks, like a very simple one, the density. The density is just the number of links that you have, so the number of connections that you have uh, in, in your network. And the transitivity is, roughly speaking, the number of triangles that you have. So you can imagine that you have three airports that are connected together in a kind of feedback loops, and they are sending delays between them, like in a, in a loop. And, and you can create these networks for different moments in time, and you can then plot the temporal evolution of these metrics, and then you can see how the, the system evolved. Because of course, this delay propagation is not a static process, but it depends on many things like what happened in the system in general. And uh, we were quite surprised at the beginning to see that there was this huge spike in, uh, this is for March, 2016, uh, which also includes a spike in the transitivity. And we said, what, what happened? What happened in 2016? Uh, well, uh, two main things happened. First of all, around the March, February, March, there were a lot of strikes in France. Uh, traffic controllers in France were on strike as it usually happens every March, but that March was especially, especially important. There were a lot of repercussion in the world system and there were a lot of delays. And the second thing is probably you remember there was this uh, terrorist attack at the Brussels airport. It was uh, at the end of March. And this created, as you can imagine, just a, uh, made havoc in the, in the system. So there were a lot of delays and especially a lot of propagation. If we, if we went back to the official uh, CODA report, CODA is the, um, the office in Europe that uh, uh, essentially controls all the statistics about air transport and especially delays. And what they reported is actually a huge increase in the uh, number of reactionary delays in uh, between 2015 and 2016. So uh, actually what we've seen is what they also saw, that is the system somehow got much more connected and there was this propagation of information around uh, that was much stronger. Uh, on the other hand, it's quite interesting to see that according also to CODA, there was a further increase when we moved to, to 2017, uh, not as big as the previous year, but still there was a, an additional increase in the number of reactionary delays that we don't see in the network. So. Actually, the network went back to a more standard structure, uh, which is quite interesting because it's telling us that uh, the network structure has little to do with the, quant the actual quantity of delays or volume of delays that you have around. So this is quite interesting because it means that, yeah, your total, your amount of delays increased, but not the number of connections that supported these delays. And this is quite good because if the number of, let's say, bad connections that are propagating these delays is under control, you could control them. That is, you can put the resources on these specific pairs of airports to try to reduce or to tackle these delays. So what, what we have seen here, it was quite interesting, especially because of that, because we are able to check the structure that there is behind this propagation of information, and this could, help us pointing or pinpointing specific airports that are responsible or not for the propagation of delays. And actually we can go one step further and we try to introduce the concept of, uh, try to understand exactly that, which are the airports responsible for that. But for that, we have to 
we added to introduce a new concept that is this one of uh, causality clustering. So imagine just a very simple situation. We have a network like this in which we have uh, three nodes here. We have one node that is sending, that is causing information, that is causing the other two nodes. So you can see this as a as an interaction or as a information flow or as a causality connection. And then we have also these other three nodes with the same structure. If we apply standard network theory, we can calculate the community structure. That is, okay, let's try to group these nodes together according to their to their connectivity. And we will say, okay, there is here a group of three nodes that are connected between them because they are actually connected. And then we have a second group of three nodes that are also connected between them. Uh, what we wanted to say here is like, uh, uh, yes, but this is not that useful for us because what we wanted to see is something like this. We have actually one group here on the left composed of two nodes that is causing all the others. And then we have here a group of four nodes that are let's say net to receivers that are just caused by the others. So I don't want to see this vertical separation because I don't care if two nodes are connected or not. What I want to see is the main flow of information. I want to see that information is going from red to green. Once we have that tool, uh, what we can do is actually ranking airports according to their probability or their, the frequency in which they are in cluster one, that is they are causing delays, or they are in cluster two, that is they are absorbing delays. And then we can see, we can start like putting names to this, uh, let's say to who, uh, uh, who is responsible for the delay propagation. We can see that Munich was a really important one, followed away by Amsterdam, Frankfurt, uh, Barcelona, and so forth. On the other hand, you have a bunch of airports that are just net receivers of these delays. They, they don't actually actively engage in the, in the propagation process. And then if you, make a correlation between the number of flights and the probability for each airport to be in the first cluster, that is to generate delays, we see that there is kind of a good correlation, which means that big airports are usually the one uh, causing the delay propagation. Uh, with a caveat, this is not just creating delays or generating delays, it's also creating a propagation of delays. So it's worse than that. It's not that necessarily big airports are generating delays because they are, uh, they are saturated, they have too many operations or whatever, but they are actually moving this information around. And this is what we want to avoid. We accept that there are delays, but we don't want delays to spread uh, in the system. So just to, to synthesize a little bit, this talk is it's going to be a little bit shorter, but I hope that at least you get some ideas and the fact that we are tackling a problem that is completely different from what you see, it has nothing to do. Uh, maybe you have experienced it at some point, which is bad, but uh, this is what we have uh, right now in the system. But the important point is that I want to move from uh, this classical uh, way of understanding the air transport that is just a set of rules that you can model. You can create a huge model in which you set some rules and you will get the final evolution of the system. No, it's not like that. It's much more complicated. And uh, uh, what I'm doing or what we are doing is exactly using ideas in network science and especially in neuroscience to try to understand how the, inform the delays are like a pro uh, information that is propagating between different airports. So we move from the local scale. We don't want to understand the specific agents, how they are interacting. We want the global scale. We want to see how this is, uh, this emerges or like this generates a phenomenon that is on a larger scale. And more importantly, I think that this has application to many other problems like uh, just human mobility, uh, urban mobility or trade networks or whatever. So every time that you have this kind of information moving around, you can use this, this tool to understand it. Uh, with the caveat that, as I've said before, in our case, we have to reconstruct the networks. So we don't have the luxury as you have to, to suppose that you have a network of chemical interactions that you can perfectly describe because you can measure it. We cannot measure it directly. We have to reconstruct it indirectly from the data 
that we have about this system. Uh, so just to conclude, here you have a couple of uh, references. I will also be happy to share this slide with you if you want to, to check them. A few people that have been working with me on this, actually, Luisina Pastorino, uh, she's my PhD student and she's connected right now. So if you have some tough questions, we can, we can ask her to, to answer to them and uh, nothing less from my side. Thank you. <laughs> okay. we, we were muted so we had to wait a little bit for there was a delay okay i, I guess that yes <laughs> yeah i guess you get lots of these jokes in online talks right it's possible yes exactly yeah so uh, we can uh, start the some questions if anybody has any questions Peter? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, from here, right? Yes, yes, more or less. Go ahead. So, please. is it right that you looked at pairwise GC measurements then? So, is, so, so, would it be possible also to look at, let's say, higher order information flows that there are two airports influencing one, and where you might have then synergistic effects? I mean, in a negative sense, of course. <laughs> So that, let's say you cannot explain the, the, the flow of information of two airports, not as a sum of single airports, let's say. That's, a, that's actually a really good point. Uh, mathematically, it's not that simple, uh, because as you know, you have a kind of course of dimensionality when you try to calculate the Granger causality or things like that on like multivariate time series and so forth. It is technically possible, and actually there are a lot of tools from network science, uh, very recent tools actually from network science to then represent and analyze these, that is, these uh, um, uh, simplicial complexes uh, on networks and so forth. So this is actually one point. Uh, on the other hand, you have to take into account that this idea of delays as information is already quite new and I would say challenging in air transport. So it's not, uh, uh, let's say people are not that open to understand it that way. So I think that if we move directly to a uh, higher dimensional uh, structure or idea, I mean, uh, people already think that I'm crazy and I don't want to fool it that too much, you know, just, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's indeed a possibility and is indeed something that we should explore in the future. Mm -hmm. That's it, thank you. More questions. If I can just follow on that. Absolutely. How much data do you need to get a proper measurement that is statistically significant? Uh, that's a good. I mean, there are no clear, um, let's say, thresholds or, uh, or requirements. Uh, in my experience, uh, you should have uh, of the order of 200 time points to apply a Granger causality and get uh, something meaningful which you may think that is not that much, but the point is that we don't have that much data because at the end you have like, for instance, 24 hours in a day. So each day 24 points. And uh, depending on the data, we may have one month of information, let's say straight connected information. So we have 600 points at the end. Uh, so we have to be careful with that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Question? Uh, just, just a remark to, to help you with, the, with your argument for, because the other models. In, in physics, we have very similar issues that you have microphysical models and you have macrophysical models. And uh, there exists a programmatic article by a very prominent physicist and mathematician. Uh, uh, the person is called Anderson. And the title is More is Different. Of course, the, the, the famous paper, yes. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. But it's, this is exactly the, the point. So one of the points that, well, I don't remember exactly if, if in these words, but it's like, uh, uh, how I, I usually describe it is like, do you need uh, to understand the movement of every single atom to describe uh, a car? Uh, actually, no. Even to describe an engine, you don't need to model every single atom. You just need to know basics of thermodynamics and then you will understand the Carnot cycle and you can create an engine and therefore a car. Uh, this is more or less the same. That is, do, do we really need to model every single element that we have in the system that is every single passenger to understand the global propagation phenomenon? No, you can just, we, we have, 
we need to define the, the correct scale to model the system. And I don't think that the, model, the correct scale is the one of individual elements. Okay, Good. more questions? I have one, it seems the right moment. I, I probably didn't call if you explained, but I understand that you were measuring mostly the delay, uh, the propagation of delays, but I, um, I'm, I'm not sure if, if, if it was mentioned that there might be some nodes that tend to absorb more the delays than the others. Because you, 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 you just explained at the end that the bigger airports have a higher chance to propagate uh, delays because of the size, you know, it just becomes more likely and what, there might be a million explanations. But I wonder if bigger airports also tend to uh, absorb more the delays than smaller airports. You see, so- Okay, that's, that's a very, yeah. So the propagation yeah, of- I, I understand the other case Instead of like the other kind of like the negative energy or the shade instead of the light kind of thinking. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. So first of all, we are not saying that it makes sense for large airports to propagate delays, uh, because actually, if you think about that, large delays have more resources to handle delays. That is, you have a larger number of runways, you have more infrastructure, you have more whatever you need. Uh, what we observe from the data is actually that large airports are propagating more. So it's not something that we were assuming a priori is something that we have found in the data. And actually what's, what's kind of interesting is that we see the opposite side that is the light side as opposed to the dark side. So when I said that I, for instance, airports like uh, uh, Lisbon Portela, they are passive, it's actually not true. They are receiving delays and they are not sending it out to the system. So they are absorbing it. They are somehow destroying delays. Uh, how can they do that? Actually, we don't know. And this is one of the limitations of this approach that is you see the forest, but then you lose the control over the single trees. But that's okay. At least we know that some airports have different behavior and we can start constructing on top of that. So that's, that's the point. But yes, it's not that simple to say as like, well, big airports are the corporate of this. No, it's no, 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 it was, more complicated. It was just to formulate the question. I, I understand. Ah, so the mechanisms for for because we can speak of resilient airports and kind of like as you say passive airports that just pass the information through others amplify information others reduce information so maybe um, I wonder if a, if a second layer of description would be to to color the nodes in this way so maybe some sort of genetic algorithm that can I don't know like just propagate this information and and then converge to a certain state where you have some solid uh, description of what the airport in, in average or expected value will do. Um, instead of just see, just uh, kind of focusing on the pure delay, which is the problem, it's good, it is the problem, but these other dimensions also, also contribute to the solution, not just yeah, to the description yeah, indeed. of the problem itself. Yeah. Indeed, not, not a bad idea, yes. And that would also allow somehow to create a what if uh, scenario that is, yes, can exactly. I yeah. really modify this airport and see that then the propagation is changed and so forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a good point. And policy making, decision making and kind of investments and all that, so. Exactly. exactly. But because they yeah. we, will always be in a, this constructivist approach as we do to, to, of course, there is a layer of a representation, which is the right one for the purposes, but that doesn't uh, really, we, we don't have to forget that there are other layers that we can still connect, but we have to connect meaningfully, not just for the pure sake of constructing from the top, but bottom to top, just because bottom is the, 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 the bottom, like, no, no. We have the, layer, the, okay. the first layer, and then we have start expanding from representation layers because there are like questions that make, that step meaningful that that's so so I, mm -hmm. I think that if you put that thing in perspective then you can make a sort of connection with these other models informed from the top information the higher layer that you are now building and then kind of go back to the small you know whenever you need it not necessarily to the exactly bottom, but maybe to some exactly layer 
yeah so yeah that's a that's a good point i was i was just thinking that uh, you have another advantage that we don't have so you have the advantage that the network is, is usually there that you, uh, we have to reconstruct it you have also another advantage is that you can try and modify the network that this is something that we cannot do or at least that is uh, let's say that really unfeasible that is we cannot go to an airport and say uh you should construct another runway let's try to construct another runway because we want to see how the degree will propagate if you construct it. that's of course beyond what we the, the power that we have the, the influence that we have in the in the policy making but yeah that's uh, but yeah it would be nice actually to have some guidelines at least to throw them there look we think that these are the that this is the solution, then it's up to policymakers to, to accept it or not. Yeah, well, good, nice. Maybe we can talk more. Uh, Aura, please uh, take the word. <clears throat> You're muted. Uh, you are muted. muted. Sorry. OK, my question is really a question because it's linked to your uh, last consideration. And first, I would like to compliment, congratulate you with uh, Massimiliano because I like it a lot, his presentation. And uh, also, I would like to ask him that in a way, if he agree, he emphasized the role of the hubs the hubs that are propagate uh, delays, but also they could propagate uh, positive information, not only delays. And then, in fact, in a way, as you said, I think maybe in the future would be nice to see how different hubs behave, because you can imagine that uh, Milan is different from Amsterdam, from Madrid, for example, and of course, depends on the data. And then, as you said, so different hubs, also, also the hubs are connected. So not only the hubs towards the other small airport, but also among the hubs. So there is a sort of um, hierarchy of hubs. So it could be also a red, as Massimiliano was showing, a link to the other red, to the other hubs. So I think that uh, the different kinds of connectivity or configuration uh, could be maybe a next step for the future. So how different typologies of connectivity could influence uh, delays or positive or propagation or information, not just, you know, the pure causality effect. So that's more or less my, my thought. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a good thought because actually looking, if I remember it correctly, uh, the results that we got, uh, Barcelona was one of the main uh, like uh, propagator of delays, while uh, Madrid Barajas was not. And uh, Barcelona is slightly smaller. Uh, you may wonder it's because Barcelona's three runways are supposed to the fourth of Madrid, and therefore Madrid has more flexibility. But this is indeed a point. So being a hub or being a large airport is not enough to justify this. There must be something else. And uh, this is a very good point. And uh, the second point is what you were mentioning, actually, the fact that there are different, let's say that the structure is not just the world network or nothing. Uh, we have like, I would plot, I would describe this as shells or as layers. That is, you have the a rich component of very big hubs, and then you can start adding like secondary airports. How is the mm -hmm. network dynamics changing according to the level uh, that you include inside? It's a very good point, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, uh, good issue. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, we seem to have one last question by Christian. Okay, yeah. hey, great. Uh, Massimiliano, Massimiliano, thank you very much. I have just uh, uh, two questions uh, to test if I did understand it right. So um, uh, you have two types, uh, generators and absorbers, and are there any more types or do you have, or is it these two types? Uh, okay, uh, good question. So what we do is to simplify the world network in two types. So we essentially say this is a, like a, a genetic algorithm that tries to say, okay, let's uh, put a, a label to each airport according to the propagation of delays and try to define which are the most like uh, generators and the most absorbing one. Actually, we have results with three types that will be like uh, generators, brokers, and absorbers. 
Oh, there okay. is in principle no limit to that that is we could do with 20 types well the limit is the computational cost that grows in a very um, bad way but yeah in, this is just to simplify the representation of the dynamics ah. ah okay and so absorbing really means to reduce the delay these are the exactly to, st to stop the propagation yes okay great thank you very much you're welcome yeah okay so I will stop the recording, uh, but first, uh, thanks again to Massimiliano for his talk. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and with this, we finish the series of talks of this workshop. So um, we now have the um, stop recording.